Welcome to Our World Plainly Seen, insights and commentary on the world around us with Dr. Frank Cowper. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's a special day for me it's, and a special day for all of us. It's 9-11, the 20th anniversary of the uh, attack on U.S. homeland and a time around which Americans of every stripe, tall and short and left and right, unite to honor the lives lost and especially the first responders and those who sacrifice themselves in the natural impulse of goodness that is buried in every human heart and soul. We're here to honor the beauty of American life and the American heart as demonstrated on this day and, and throughout many days after. And Unexpectedly to me, I have the tremendous pleasure and honor and opportunity today, just from a prior appointment looking for a time that we could possibly meet, and here it is on this very day of great importance to our national life. I'm with Professor Luan Rouse. A real and honest bio of the man would take all day, but I've picked three important aspects of the work of the professor. Professor Rouse has been a civil rights activist for his entire adult life and has been intimately involved with Dr. King and right throughout the trajectory in the present, up to the present time. He's presently a professor of theology, and most importantly, perhaps, at least in the moment, Professor Rouse is the national co-chair of the American Clergy Leadership Conference, an organization of great influence throughout the United States and now becoming influential in the world at large as well as this uh, work among American clergy starts to reach out to clergy internationally, parts of the world as well. So I've spoken too long by way of introduction, but uh, Dr. Rouse, thanks very much for doing this with me this today. It's good to be with you, Dr. Kaufman. And I have been an admirer of your work and the things that you do for the interfaith and for the journey that we're on thinking through life. Thank you. We can talk about a million things as we often do, you and I. <laughs> but today, today, I would just like to have the word of your heart and the word of your wisdom, especially on this very day, on the 9-11 commemoration. Uh, I've sprung this interview on you. I didn't call you a week or two to have you put thoughts and, uh, and uh, preparation together. But I don't want to miss the chance to hear from you because... I always learn from you, and I know our listeners will as well. Let's just start. What is this day? Tell us something we should think about. We should never forget to remember those who suffered for us in actuality. Unexpectedly, they did. And their lives took on greater value into the mindsets of all of those who were not as close to them but also took on a deep, lasting, eternal sorrow for those who were close. So part of what we ought to remember is that in that which is often given sacrificially expected or unexpected for our good, there are still those who suffer the ill from that which was never to be intended by God. It mm. was so with Jesus Christ. It was so with all who have sacrificed willingly or unwillingly. And some of us benefit from it. But there are those who are really there at heart with them who are broken. Mm. And that remains. It's a very deep point and helpful to bring our hearts to that place. We can't be careless when there are those around us still suffering and will forever from the events of this day. The people to whom you refer are of two sorts. One are the victims who were simply doing their day's work, went to work, went to their office and lost their lives in the attack. And then there were the first responders that raced up into a collapsing high rise, one of the tall, maybe the tallest building on earth, almost guaranteed to their death, just to, just to save any single life they could find. And, and they lost their lives as well. So there's two types of victims. 
not victim, I don't want to call them victims, but there's two types of loss of life in this tragic event on this, on this day of commemoration. And what I think what you're referring to or calling our heart attention toward are those that survive the loss of their son, the loss of their daughter, the, or their mom or dad. This is what you've asked us to remember. That's right. Yes. That there are those who, who I refer to oftentimes when I pray to God, the living suffering. And that they suffer while living here. It will be in that suffering until the day in which they themselves ascend, unless there's just some miraculous healing of that that I cannot see. I'm too small to see. Mm. But, I know, but because I'm of the mindset too, that God is suffering with them. Yes. That God did not desire that. God is broken hearted by what is, has taken place. And hopefully, with, with our understanding all of that, we are helping to heal the heart of God. Especially if we understand it in a way to make things better. Mm. That we take on a path towards the beauty and goodness of creation instead of thinking think that we've got to stay in that condition. Mm. And so this day has a, a two-pronged situation for me when I'm praying. And that has to do, on one hand, with those who still come to this day, and I'm grateful to them for reading the names of the 3,000 that we know uh, was just right here in New York. That, that were killed. But that continues us in that deepness of grief and deepness of pain. And maybe over generations, it will be able to be done and done appropriately as a remembrance and a celebratory of life remembrance. But right now, it is still too dear to let go of the pain, the yeah. agony of the suffering. But then, the other part of it is those of us who are living in that suffering as a reminder to step towards what's better, to clear this path in a way where it shouldn't happen again. Very good. So there's almost, as you speak and remind us of whom you call the living suffering, there's almost two things that we can consider doing with our lives. One is to always be ready and caring and attentive to and embracing the living suffering. Not be so coarse or crude or distracted that we're not compassionate and ready to have solidarity and loving human relationship in case we don't know who are even among us, right? We might, they might be sitting next to us, right next to us in the subway. And so as long as we're alert and sensitive, the interpersonal compassion is something that improves us and maybe they can feel or maybe a word might be exchanged. We, we never know. We have to be ready and alert and caring, like alert in heart, where we might be able to be one whom God calls to give a word and then that they know that people are aware of that or sensitive. And then the other thing is... We also have to live in such a way toward making it less and less possible that these things happen in the world. That's an entirely different type of consciousness. That's, right. that, that's correct. And one other thing that comes to my mind every year at this time is that we never know who we're with at the final moment of our existence. Because we could be together today and I not see any other person. You might be the last person that I see eye to eye, face to face, and be able to talk to in person. And that has meaning too. Indeed. And we may never know the fullness of that meaning because we don't know, know the real tr essence of these moments. Mm. But we should live each moment as a moment of value. Mm. and value the person that we're with as though it's the last moment that we have an opportunity to make a contribution. Mm. Those who were on the plane that day did not know that they were boarding 
a plane to give their last contribution. But their last contribution is one from that existence that's going to be forever and ever. Mm. Not only the ones who were in the building that the plane hit, but the ones that were in the plane as well. Mm. So I hope that we value our existence, existence enough to value the existence of those that we interact with. And somewhere in that is the hope that if that can be sincere within our heart, it becomes sincere in the hearts of those who consider themselves to be our enemies, though we may not consider them to be an enemy. Yes. So if we're going to end all of this bitterness and hatred, somehow we need to start within ourselves to value loving the other enough to call a halt to hatred Mm. and call up all of the power that we can gender towards one another that equates to true love Mm. and that has such importance. That's really profound, Uh, Prof. You've got me on that one. It's, It's almost as though you've said enough to make the whole world heaven. Just in that, just in that observation, uh, imagine, imagine that you're you're on that plane, normal everyday plane. You fly all the time, and there's another one. The girl or the young fella comes by with your drink, your meal. Are you nice? Are you mean? Are you are you <laughs> nasty? Or, and it might be your last. That's right. This and uh, if we could start to start to have that sensitivity. Uh, that's enough to create heaven right there if everybody started that. And that's a very deep observation. I'm very grateful to hear it. Mm. Before we started taping, uh, you were telling me that you've always made effort to have a commemoration or something related to this day over the course of your ministry. And can you tell us what you were describing? In 2011, I was inspired, having served in the military as a chaplain for over 20 years, to really look at how are we responding to what took place on 9-11 of 2001. And what came to me later after contemplating that that day, I was in my pastoral office at the Huntington United Methodist Church. And I just went into deep thought, I would call it, so that everybody can give respect to that. And what came was, we're not going to defeat terrorism by traditional military means. So I was inspired to say every day, read a psalm and pray for against terrorism for the making of world peace. Mm. That this is to be divinely carried out. Mm. Now you're doing people. this as a military chaplain. No, I was already out of the military. All right. And it's but I was mi- reflecting from my mindset oh, okay. as a chaplain mm-hmm. earlier that morning. And this was in the afternoon that this thought came to me. So I committed myself and decided that it needed to be started on 9-11 every year that I would invite everybody who would have uh, an experience with it, to read through a psalm and pray for 150 days in unison together, asking God to intervene with us. And those of us who are known by faith to be with God and therefore God dwelling within us, we band together. Mm. And that the greater way to defeat terrorism is to reach into the heart of everybody. Yes. So if we come in unity and we're reading through the Psalms and praying against terrorizing one another Mm. and seeking the love of God within our hearts, that that is the road towards world peace. And John Kennedy used to call it cooperative peace. Yes. But uh, as you and I know, there are those who are deeply uh, committed to God's will and God's true love Mm -hmm. and to return to the original intention of God 
that we might follow the commands of God. And God says that if we love those commands, then we're loving God. And that those of us who keep those commands, God is loving us. Yeah. So the intention of coming to this day every year and starting with Psalm 1 mm-hmm. and then reading through that, inviting others to read through that with us. And then I share a prayer along with that reading every, every day mm. for world peace. Wow, wow. And, uh, usually every year I add an ask aspect to it. Uh-huh. I had, I spoke with a rabbi one year. Yes. And that rabbi reminded me that this is a powerful thing. And he said, you do it every day. I said, yeah, I know I'm committed to doing it. Right, day. right. I said, but annually I invite others into it. He what says, a well, thing, yeah. We need to begin to teach everybody. He says, you don't know how powerful God has called you to bring a an understanding to the world that really will lead to world peace. Yep. Yep. He says, so let's keep doing that, studying that together and keep calling people to it. Yeah. So I do. And this year I invited uh Mary Kamar. Yes. Who I known as a student at UTS at the Unification Theological Seminary. And she has since left, but she taught Hebrew when I was teaching her at seminary Mm -hmm. at the uh, Metropolitan Community United Methodist Church in Harlem. Mm -hmm. She would teach Hebrew to to the members there. Mm -hmm. So I asked her if she would do a reading in Hebrew, one or more of the uh, verses every day. Yeah. This year, as a part of that, to call in. My intention with that is. To call about the unity of those of us who are of Judeo-Christianity, those who are Islamic, and those who are Jewish, and other religions too. Mm Because all of us somehow will get back at somewhere along the line of going back to the original voices, the original language that spoke for God. That's it. That's right. And Mm -hmm. so... Today, you know, as I was reading and I read, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That is the essentiality of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary spoke it in in Hebrew. Now, if you don't mind, I'll share those words. Please, I love that. You know, Professor, as you do, you know what I've always admired in your work. You always call us to be one people. Mm. Your studies, your research, your sharing from your mind, from your experiences, from your hope, from your heart, Thank you. is about us understanding this. And I'm just so appreciative to have this opportunity to share with you because from your work, I truly believe we become one family. Thanks, Prof. I, I'm moved and grateful to hear it. And we, we uh, shoulder to shoulder and arm in arm, are walking with deadly seriousness to lift off the burdens and allow people to see the beauty in in one another Mm -hmm. and to fall in love with one another. Mm -hmm. You've given us a ton of great food for thought and you've also given us a movement of peace to join, Mm -hmm. which lasts half a year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) There you go, 150 days. 150 days. And uh, maybe when people start to discover that God comes to earth through such a uh, communal dedication and devotion in prayer and study, Maybe someone someone will start the other 150 days and we'll be on safe ground. we get that together, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So thank you so much thank for you. doing this brief conversation 
together and uh, it will mean a lot for me in all the days to come but also in all the years to come thank you thanks for being on this call god bless god bless